Thank you for joining us this morning. I realise this was a rather quick turnaround invite, um, but we've had a good number of people sign up this morning. So thank you for joining us. And of course, it will be available um, online as a recording afterwards, as is normal for our quick bites. Um, I'm Anna Taylor, the Executive Director here at the Food Foundation, and I'm really thrilled that Rachel and Sylvester has joined us today. Um, straight fresh off the train, I'm imagining, from the party conference, <laughs> Rachel. Um, Very late but, last night because of multiple cancellations, delays, oh, goodness knows oh, what. Oh, it sounds like I was lucky then, I had a little bit <laughs> earlier. Um, so uh, brilliant, thank you for making the time. And um, we're also conscious having this conversation today that party conferences haven't quite finished. So we've got Wes Streetings doing his speech today and we've got the SNP conference at the weekend. So we might do another one a little bit later on and reflect on some of those additional events. But we're chatting today about what's happened so far. Um, I haven't properly introduced you, Rachel. You're a columnist at um, The Times, but also you're doing this huge piece of work with the Times Health Commission. Do you want to just briefly say what it is, just so everyone can kind of get a flavour at the beginning? Yeah, sure. So it's a year long project, which is really unusual for a newspaper to spend. A, I, I'm basically spending a whole year chairing this thing about one subject, which is health in its widest sense. So that includes obviously NHS waiting lists, ambulances, GPs, but also the role of the food culture that we've got. And Anna, you've given evidence to us. We're holding fortnightly evidence sessions. Um, we've got an amazing group of commissioners um, who include clinicians, business leaders. Henry Dimbleby, who did the government's food strategy, is, is one of our commissioners, uh, and also some economists, scientists. So it's a real mixture of people. Um, we will come up with a report with recommendations for reform in January next year. Uh, so we're quite a way through the process, um, and it's been absolutely fascinating. Yeah, and it sounds like you've done lots of interesting research about what's been going on in other countries as well, which, I mean, that may come up in conversation today. Um, great, well, let's get started. Um, so we're going to be talking particularly about the conversations that have been happening about sort of diet and health and food and health, particularly in today's conversation. And I wanted to start with reflecting on where we've got to with smoking, because smoking has come up a lot in conversations. It came up in, obviously, the Prime Minister's speech um, and setting out, you know, a ramping up further of, of policies around smoking, prevention of smoking. And, um, and of course, the Labour Party's done a lot of this on this historically um, in terms of getting us to the, reducing smoking. But also we've seen Wes treating taking really quite, I mean, certainly in one of the events that I heard him speak at, he was clearly really passionate about trying to prevent the marketing of vaping to children and young people in particular, and was really concerned about these sort of unicorn pink cloud flavours or whatever that were being targeted specifically at children and young people. Um, I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on you know, we've reached such a sort of strong political consensus, really, around smoking, at least. Do you think it's um, realistic to think that we might get there with some of the sort of with respect to some of the worst foods which are being produced at the moment? Is that how long do you think that kind of can I mean, with your experience of sort of reporting on these issues over time, what do you think? Do you think that's a reasonable expectation? How long would that take? I think it's a really interesting question. So obviously there's now this consensus around effectively banning smoking altogether over time for younger generations, um, which is in a way a very nanny status policy. So it's politicians admitting that sometimes the state does need to intervene to protect people and to create this kind of healthy environment. Um, and, and in a way more surprising for Rishi Sunak to come out in favour of that policy and a lot of conservatives were uh, are quite anti the kind of free marketeers Liz Truss Boris Johnson um, won't like that at all but Rishi Sunak um, obviously came back from his holidays deciding he might as well go for broke he was you know he was behind in the polls he might as well say what he thought and this was one of the flagship policies that he alighted on and Labour has been looking at this for some time. I remember interviewing Wes Streeting a few months ago, actually, when he spoke about how he favoured, um, at least was very looking very closely at what they've done in New Zealand, which is 
uh, this same idea of raising the age at which you can buy a cigarette. So effectively over time you outlaw it. Um, and he talked about how he'd grown up in a household of smokers and he was really, you know, hated smoking as a result. It's, and both he and Sunek have talked about how there's nothing good about smoking. So, uh, and that's why they're both also saying they want to make sure that children who aren't smokers don't start vaping because it's very different to use it as a smoking cessation tool and, you know, hooking people on vapes uh, as mm. almost a gateway to nicotine. Um, but then to your question about whether that then tips over into food policy, I think at the moment that's less clear because um, the, there's a kind of anxiety uh, among the political parties about anything that impacts on the cost of living. Um, and as we know, the most disadvantaged families are the, mo are, are the most dependent on these cheap um, ultra processed foods. So it's very difficult to balance that. So um, certainly when I interviewed Wes Streeting, he talked about how he wanted to use the heavy hand of state regulation to create a better food culture, as well as to um, clamp down on smoking and vaping. Um, and he, but he had, he's backed away from things like supporting the buy one, get one free um, ban. Uh, when I talked to him, he supported the, made clear they would um, go ahead with the sort of ban on um, uh, advertising of junk food okay, before yeah. the water bed, if they get in. Um, but since then, his, his language has become a bit more worried about the cost of living crisis and a bit less worried about the health implications. I don't know what you picked up on the fringes. And I think the other thing from the Tory party point of view, what I took from the conference was that the stars of that show, apart from Rishi Sunak for his um, speech, were Liz Truss and Nigel Farage, mm -hmm. who was dancing with Pretty Patel. So if the Tories lose the election, go into opposition, they will only go in one direction, which will not be the direction that favors any kind of regulation uh on food policy yeah it's really interesting i mean i i was very struck by a comment that uh i can't remember who it was now made in one of the one of the fringe events where they said you know we look back now on tobacco policy as being like you know it was really hard this was a reflection on what labor did um during the blair years um it was yeah. really hard at the time but now we look at it and we realise it was it's a sort of feels like a no brainer that we would have done yeah. that, you know. And the idea and, that we'd all be sitting in smoking carriages in the tube or on the aeroplanes. Exactly. Smoking. I mean, it's unbelievable now. That... Yeah. And yeah. And then we had young people, uh, you know, we had um, uh, one of the, the panels that I was chairing. We had a one of Bite Back's activist ambassadors saying just last week she had lucas aid coming into her school and giving out free samples and putting them on the tables that the kids were sitting around <laughs> i mean it Incredible. felt like the connections were yeah really strong and then i mean the other the other interesting comment was there's uh, no interesting piece there's been a bit of um an academic paper recently that's looked back at uh, the tobacco companies in the 80s and 90s in America and how they started to take over, buy up big food brands and looking at some of those connections. And I was at a, it was a sort of um, meeting on the microbiome a couple of weeks ago and somebody stood up from the audience and said, my friend of mine is head of comms for a tobacco company and he's getting loads of calls from the food industry now about how to handle um, the press that were, were the, the the stuff that's going on around ultra processed foods, which I thought was really interesting as well. Um, yeah. So these connections sort of start that's suddenly to feel a, like they're a little bit closer. I think there's been a bit of a reluctance to link food with tobacco because obviously we do need to eat. It's not the same exactly. as tobacco. But... Yeah, and 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 obviously food, even small quantities of you know, high fat or high salt food or high sugar food are okay, but it's no cigarette is okay. It's exactly. good for you. But the, in terms of the politics, I thought it was a really interesting, I was at one fringe with Matthew Taylor, who I think you might've been there as well, yeah. Um, who was the head of the Downing Street policy unit when they introduced the smoking ban. He's now head of the NHS Confederation. So he's looking at it from the other side, if you like. But he said he'd bumped into 
when when they introduced this ban on smoking in public places under the Labour government, there was a huge row in the cabinet and half the, you know, there were quite a, two or three cabinet members who were very anti the ban. Um, and he persuaded Blair, he said, that it was the right thing to do. They went ahead with it and never looked back effectively. Um, but what was interesting, he said he bumped into one of the special advisors to one of the cabinet ministers who deposed it recently. And this advisor had said, well, you know, that he blamed the ban on smoking for the Brexit vote because it had taken away the pleasure of sort of working class voters in the red wall seats who ended up backing Brexit. So there is that, it, I mean, I thought that was fascinating, but well, obviously fascinating. not true. I, you said so link those two things is extraordinary, but it shows you the sort of, um, what's the word? It's almost, it's the sort of paranoia, high state of paranoia that politicians often who sort of live in London and sort of steeped in a kind of London mindset, think about voters in some of the most deprived parts of the country, that their sort of simple pleasures um, mustn't be yeah. taken away from them. I remember John Reid, I don't know whether it was John Reid's aide who'd said this to Matthew Taylor, but John Reid at the time of the smoking ban sort of opposing it because, you know, we mustn't take away the pleasures of the working class. Um, so it's in a way quite patronising. And, and also when it comes to food, it, the question is that actually what choice do people really have if, if you're bombarded by unhealthy food, unhealthy adverts, and, you know, and actually you, you're living in a place where you can't buy any healthy food. Yeah, yeah, or, or can't afford it. Yeah, one or, or the can't. other, yeah, yeah. Okay, really interesting. Um, so let's, you've reflected a little bit on what we've heard from Wes Streeting about where Labour are at, sort of, as you say, clear on wanting to take forward marketing restrictions. Um, well, and... he was clear a few months ago. I'm not sure now what the position is because um, uh, in an, he did an interview with a colleague of mine at the weekend. Well, so it'd be interesting to see what he says in his speech today. Yeah. But he, um, the language yeah. is a little bit. Yeah. And certainly a real reluctance on anything that could affect price. So multi-buys and taxes um, sort of ruling out at this point. But I think said yesterday in an event that I was at, really want to drive reformulation. And okay. there aren't that many options for how you can achieve reformulation. Um, and I think has also been said relatively recently that he used the Kit Kat breakfast cereal debacle as a sort of illustration of why the food industry can't do this on their own. We can't expect them to act on yeah. their own. Um, so that's where so you end up with the tax, isn't it? Because, so I think that's their sort of way to swap square the circle, if you like. You say, if you do a, a tax, an extra tax of some kind, with it. so we, we had Tony Blair give evidence to the, health commission recently he talked about how you ought to have expand the sugar tax to other forms of sugary drinks but also look at fat taxes or other kinds of high taxes on things that are high in salt but the purpose of that would not be to drive up the price of the food the purpose would be to drive reformulation so that's a way of squaring that circle um so it's a kind of it doesn't have to be an anti um, cost of living measure if you like yeah absolutely and of course really thinking about I mean I think really thinking about how you can use any revenue from a tax to really make affordable uh healthier options for for people that want them and um there's clear that that's a very very strong when you talk to families on a low income we survey people a lot that's their sort of number one priority make those those foods more affordable for us so really thinking about how you can use those yeah. fiscal measures to create that seesaw effect of price I think is really important I mean maybe we should just also mention um where the Lib Dems are at so we've got um they published their they had a motion which supported their new food and farming paper which is a really I mean it's a pretty comprehensive look at a, a range of issues around food and farming and they've got on their list that they uh, want to go further. They want to implement the uh, 
advertising restrictions um but want to go further they want to they're thinking about labeling and what you can do on pack to alert people to some of the risks and uh, of of unhealthier foods um they want to expand the sugary drinks tax i mean this is interesting on tax everyone loves the sugary drinks tax yeah. whether it's neil o'brien at the tory party conference or um da uh, daniel zeichner in in uh in labor you know it's like and everyone seems to say that's been a clear success so this yeah clear that that's been a really important sort of building block for thinking about what might happen next and the Lib Dems and the really reason they, and the, it. the reason they like it is because it drove reformulation and it didn't drive up price so that's the in a way that shows you can do it um and that definitely so even um George Osborne um, said to us on the Health Commission the other day that he would he, he would now go further with it as well. So all in a way that's got cross party support. Um, it's just whether or not it looks at an election as if they're making you pay more for your yeah. unhealthy food. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other area that again the Lib Dems talk about is reformulation sort of strategy sector by sector so there seems to be this sort of there's quite a lot I mean when you look at it there's a lot of common ground and reluctance on some of the the areas that might really get into some of the fiscal incentives within the within the system and obviously we kind of know where the conservatives are at because we've seen their proposals on the table some of them having rolled back but I think what's interesting now is that they are as you say using I mean we had Steve Barclay sort of say I won't, I don't support what the well, I don't exactly know what his words were, don't support what the Welsh government did on multi-buys, which obviously the Welsh government have proceeded with the multi-buy promotions restrictions and they'll start to be introduced next year. But picking out, even though those are conservative policies that have been developed under the conservative government, <laughs> but picking them out to, to make a fight, yeah. Trying to weaponize that idea of the cost of living is gonna get worse. But I think Steve Barclay is quite on the libertarian wing. Mm. Um, and they, the thing I found slightly depressing is that idea that let's just spend money on, you know, throwing drugs at the problem and basically get all these anti-obesity drugs into people as a solution because they don't want to be seen as the nanny state. Um, and it's, I just, it, it sort of feels very short-sighted because the cost of that is going to be absolutely um catastrophic if they really put all their eggs in that basket to mix a metaphor yeah that's right and i was struck by because i didn't go to the conservatives my colleagues did and they said that that was coming up a lot and i didn't i don't think i heard it once at labor um interestingly um but and, of course... and labor the language in keir starmer's speech was all about the importance of prevention stopping problems dealing with the symptoms rather than uh, dealing with the root causes rather than just the symptoms um mm -hmm. so there is there is i think they know they aren't they they bought into the argument they know it's right but they're worried about anything that will be a hostage to fortune before the election in terms of pushing up the price of food yeah um i want to come back to this point about weaponizing because I I'm really worried about this because we had the we had the it came up with respect to meat as well. Um, so we had mm -hmm. the energy secretary Claire Coutinho said in her speech she said it's no wonder Labour seems to be so relaxed about taxing meat, um, which there hasn't been any com you know was a sort of mythical meat tax really. I don't mm -hmm. think anyone's really been pushing a meat tax or <laughs> you know anyway. It was uh, one I'm of really... Rishi's things along with his seven bins. Exactly. And the seven bins. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm I'm really a concerned and I because I think we've in the last uh, year and a bit, we've taken we've lost a lot of ground in, in with respect to thinking about food and the role of the state in helping to create healthier food environments. We had, you know, because Liz Trust sort of ran her campaign up off, off the back of the bog off stuff and yeah. And I, I'm just worried we're going to get more of this and it's going mm. to really squeeze the political space for action. Um, do you think that's a reasonable yeah. worry to be having? Well, I think the Conservatives, um, as I said, I think they're going 
the kind of trajectory is towards this culture war. I mean, I was amazed by the number of attacks on woke, various woke things from the platform at the Tory conference. I mean, it was just absurd when you think about what the world is facing, um, you know, not just in Israel, Palestine, but, you know, Ukraine, climate change, the NHS, mm -hmm. you know, all these huge challenges. And they seem to be obsessed by, you know, something called woke um and there was one you know steve barkley who's in charge of the nhs he's his only main policy flagship policy seemed to be banning transgender people on hospital wards or you know and it was yeah. it's so i but that's a deliberate um political strategy which is about creating dividing lines with labor and i think you're right there is a risk that food policy falls into that um but I think in a way it shouldn't be party political, should it? It shouldn't be. And also it's about where you, I mean, the, in a way, the narrative um, for Labour or for people on the, uh, the sort of non-libertarian side of that is, is actually where the freedom isn't there at the moment. You know, there isn't a free market. People don't have genuine choice. So it's about rebalancing you know re giving letting people take back control to coin a phrase exactly yeah um, rather than removing control so it i think actually i don't think it quite really works for the culture war but i think um it's going to this next election is going to be really bitterly fought on a lot of those dividing lines um and if something can be defined as woke so do you remember was it suella braverman who talked about the tofu chomping North okay. London elite, um, along with Liz Truss and the North London townhouses. So there's something about... And then Jacob Brees Briesmog talking about fake meat, I want to have hormone-injected Australian meat. Yeah, and, exactly. But, you so know, something yeah. about putting um, food in with all those culture war issues, um, which is kind of obviously wrong at one level, but you can see how it works from their point of view. Yeah, yeah, I and I don't know, I mean, I don't quite know from the perspective of sort of an organisation like ours, like what, how you um, respond that, to that um, in a way which doesn't reinforce dividing lines yeah is quite a challenge to to really think about how because it's it feels like a big moment of jeopardy for for those of us that are really yeah trying to see um some good policies around around diet and health um the thing that really has shocked me on the health commission is that sense that you've got malnutrition rising and obesity rising simultaneously and for the same reason and that is something that's nothing to do with dividing lines or fake meat or tofu or that is just shocking. Um, you know, yeah. and I don't think anyone and that also puts the food debate alongside and in synergy with the cost of living crisis. Yeah. So it's they're not at odds, are they? They're they're, not at all. they're not completely at all. the opposite. I mean, they're I don't they they are they're part of the same two sides of the same coin that's right and there are obviously a raft of policies that could be put in place to um support low-income families to be able to afford um more healthy food and you know uh, and in fact you know the things that can happen in places to try and improve the food environments where because obviously there's this sort of very marked um association between areas of deprivation and concentration of fast food for example so yeah did, did you the, the, the pick up any of the sort of positive ideas for promoting i mean what uh, what did you pick up on the fringe any of the sort of how you can um promote healthy food so the carrots if you like literally metaphorically rather than just the sticks um i mean i was i suppose i the ideas which were not crystallized but they were very useful conversation on were, were about um should labor get in and they have this sort of mission driven approach which opens up an opportunity for thinking about social determinants of ill health in a more comprehensive way i mean that's the ambition and also really thinking about what is the role of the voluntary sector alongside the state in creating 
resilient communities which were a really interesting panel which was just really about the role of charities in in the context of a labor government um but it was really very nuanced um the mayor of bristol was speaking and and talking about how you you don't want to just focus on public services you want to create an ecosystem in communities yeah. which um, really builds resilience so that should the policies change, you're not leaving households sort of bereft, which is, I think, what we've seen a lot of in in the re in recent years. So to your point, there are lots of quite a lot of really interesting community based initiatives, which are about how do we get fresh fruit and veg to low income families? Uh, is that by um, new routes to market for producers? Is it about um vouchers for your local market um is it about social prescribing like what are that mix of different right. things that yeah. that can um where the voluntary sector can uh not that they can afford to do it but if they were financed properly to do it have lots of innovation going on in communities which are really around improving access and those are all tailored to the specifics of of those communities where which is of course where the voluntary sector can really add a huge amount of sort of value so I think there's some interesting things to think about there um, mm. obviously we've got the national healthy start scheme which is a voucher scheme which has flaws but has really evaluated well um, so what does that what does that how can we build out from that I think is yes. an interesting set of sort of policy questions in addition to free school meals of many, course how many people benefit from that Oh, it's small. It's something yeah. like I'm going to get the numbers probably wrong, but it's about uh, 500,000 families, something like that sort of size. I mean, it's highly targeted. It's only for pregnant mums and children under the age of four. And you have to be very low income to qualify. Yeah. And they and get the money. And it, has are... be, it has to be spent on fruit and veg mm. fruit and veg and milk um uh but the problem that there is at the moment is that a third of people qualify and not actually getting the scheme it's just insane right. even in the context of the cost of living crisis so just okay for a host of reasons it's too much long to get into now but um we've reached the end of our time and it's been really interesting rachel thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and reflections um i just wanted to say um just to remind people when don't just remind people when the health commission's coming out so that they're yes, ready. <laughs> so it comes out in January. Um, we're definitely going to be uh having a whole section on kind of public health, obesity, food. I've been in Japan, uh, which have an incredible um both pro promotion of healthy eating, but also action to to prevent obesity in a sort of more stick type way um including forcing companies to measure their employees waste which i was rather amazed to find um but that so we'll come out in uh january and all the content uh that about stories that i've written so far and that other people have written uh, is available um outside the paywall so it's all free to read on the times oh. website so if you google times health commission you can find uh everything that we've written so far about it Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. I'm looking forward to really looking forward to seeing what you conclude. Um, so thank you for joining us and thank you everybody else for joining us. If you haven't yet seen our manifesto for the next election, here it is. Do find it on our website and also don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Uh, lots of these issues are being discussed there as well um, over the next few weeks. So thank you so much, Rachel, and oh, um, thanks, look forward to being in touch again soon. Thanks everyone thank for joining. You. Bye. Bye.